Buenos dias. Mis amigos. Alright, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about this comment here and then I'll probably end the video and then do another video concentrating on this fella here and maybe break it up sort of happen instead of having one long video I have two we'll see how it goes all right so harvest workers 1218 says from the 108 to 120 mark you explained your reason why Satan can no longer deceive the nations but you didn't provide us with any scriptures other than your own words to confirm your belief all right so that's fair that's absolutely fair so that's my mistake I should have been more thorough and so that's what I'm gonna do today I'm gonna be more thorough so that you might be able to see it obviously uh, there's this false teaching that Jesus is going to reign a thousand years and Bible's very clear. I'm going to show this. Now I better show it now, hadn't I? Jesus does not reign a thousand years. All right, we can destroy that idea with one verse in Luke chapter 1 verse 33. All right. So, and he shall reign, speaking of Jesus, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end all right and then um, <laughs> I don't want to go too far off topic here or off thought here but first Corinthians 15 he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet so we're gonna find out exactly um, what this is talking about and I assure you that this is not a contradiction to Luke chapter 1 verse 33 and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end all right let's let's not lose sight of that okay now harvest worker he he lists a bunch of these uh, verses here and let me just go over a couple here I have listed some scriptures below that confirm the exact opposite of what you have stated in your video. According to the Apostle Peter and Apostle Paul, we will see that Satan is still at work deceiving the nations. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. Alright, so let's go there. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 32 Whoa. give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God alright so um, you, that, that's a real big stretch to say that this verse is the opposite of um, you know what are you saying here Mark uh, you explained your reason why Satan can no longer see the nations and you're saying that he can because of this verse give none offense neither to the Jews nor the Gentiles nor the Church of God okay so <clears throat> this tells me that I have utterly failed you and so let me try to rectify that and uh, make things much much clearer all right Acts 5 verse 3 but Peter said Ananias why has Satan filled thine heart to the lie to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of land um, no to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me no that's that's not that's not even all right so you're not even okay the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly okay so <clears throat> to deliver such an one 
unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, lest Satan be should take advantage of you, or lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Okay, and on and on. So, I mean, you could have made a lot longer list than that. Uh, I'm not making any sort of claim that Satan has no power, no influence on the world today. I'm not saying that at all. Okay. And that's that seems to be what you're arguing against. You're arguing against something that I'm not against a claim that I have not made. All right, down here it says, according to scripture, Satan is still the god of this world. Okay, first of all, Satan is not a god. Let's go to Second Second uh, Corinthians four. Where are we at here? Second Corinthians four. Let's do it this way. Put that at the front there. Second Corinthians four. Verse 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Right, Satan is not a God. Period. That's important to know and important to understand. If you view Satan as God, there's something wrong with your heart, really, seriously. Satan is not God at all. People view Satan as God. I don't doubt that at all. Some people might view, you know, uh, yeah, the TV as God. I don't know. You can you can view whatever you want as God, but it doesn't make that that object or whatever God. There's only one God. All right, so. I'm, I'll get in trouble if I don't, if I'm not thorough on this. One God. See, somewhere I think it says one God. For there is one God. Right there. Do, do I need to go further? Do I need to go further? There is one God. Now, that's, I think that's enough, isn't it? There's only one God. Satan, is, and it's not Satan. Alright, so I just want to make that crystal clear because it seems to me that there are a lot of people implying this idea that Satan is a god and Satan is neither a god nor a being but okay let's stay on topic here all right and according to scripture Satan is still the god of this world Satan is not god of this world <laughs> as well as the prince of the power of the air Ephesians 2 Verse 2, where in, in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And he has spiritual government set up in the heavenly realm. Yeah, oh, let's go to it though. Uh -oh. 12 yeah for we wrestled not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places okay and when Jesus Christ returns in power and great glory he will have Satan bound with a great chain that he should deceive the nations no more until the Lord's millennial reign on earth is complete. Okay. So that's where you just, you fell off the cliff right there. All right. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, we see that at the last trump, Right, this signifies the end of the world. At the end of the world, death is swallowed up in victory. All right, so there is no more Satan. Um, 
and there's no more unsaved people. At, at the end of the world is when all the unsaved people are destroyed. At the end of the world is when all the unsaved people will be destroyed. Now there's a lot of verses that we can go to that really, you know, talk about. Um, you know, the end of the world. Let's see, you know, I'm not sure where I'm going right here. But, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Alright, so, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world, and then when it's the end of the world, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So you cannot have a thousand years of what? unsaved people not living in sin that you know people never want to talk about that part of it what's going on during this thousand years is this when people are walking around with their heads cut off and they're living and reigning with Christ without a head for a thousand years I mean if that's what you believe just be honest because we read here that John sees people that are beheaded living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Alright, so you, just be honest if that's what you believe. Alright. Now, <clears throat> let's see here. We're... What else can we cover here? And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Okay. So again, this is a prophecy that goes all the way back to Genesis 3. Alright. And this is the prophecy that is fulfilled on the last day. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. This is it right here Genesis 3 verse 15 and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel the enmity is uh, essentially you know <laughs> this sounds dumb but because it's so simple but this is there is good and there is bad okay and there is enmity between good and bad so they don't they don't get along right I will put enmity between thee and the woman right the thee is talking about the serpent which is the absence of the Spirit of God and the woman representing the Spirit of God and between thy seed, which is the seed of the serpent, and her seed, which is the which is the seed of Abraham, which is the seed of Christ, which is Christ, right, which is God's people, and then the serpent seed is the unsaved people. All right, and it shall bruise thy head. Talking about. Um, the God will bruise the serpent's head. All right. This enmity that is between the serpent and the woman, and between the serpent seed and 
her seed, which is God's seed. Right. It shall bruise the head of the serpent at the end of the world. So also will that crushing of the serpent's head bruise his heel, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ. He will stomp his foot on the head of the serpent and it will bruise his heel. This happens at the end of the world. All right, and so this is important to understand because this is mentioned all throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible. I'm only giving you a couple of examples here, okay? And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is exactly what it's referring to. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then here you got what was that verse? And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Notice the wording on that. Here, let's confirm. I just, I don't want, you know, somebody could quote, oh, that's what, you know, that's what the Romans 16 verse 21 says, and buggy woogie woogie. Well, wait a second. Is that what the Bible says? You know, somebody could do that theoretically, right? So let's confirm. And God and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Okay, so notice the warning of this. God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Under our feet. Right? So this implies that we're up in the air. And the unsaved are at our feet all right so this this should be very obvious right this is pretty clear that this prophecy given in Genesis 3 verse 15 is when the Lord will stomp his foot on the head of the serpent here in Romans 16 it says the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet like what we read in Psalm 110, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Right? Till I make, oh, wait a second, there it is. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So we're going to be up in the air when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We're going to be lifted up into the air. And then God is going to destroy. The serpent All right. should be should be pretty clear there's the enmity between the serpent and God's people be, or between the unsaved and the saved there's enmity and at the end of the world Jesus is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent now this is Clear. Not just not it. Not just is Jesus going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent. We're going to be up there in the air with him. That's the point I'm trying to get across. That we're going to be up in the air with the Lord when this happens. All right. And so, if you understand that, then you understand. In Revelation 20, verse 9, when Satan is loosed at the end of the thousand years, and the unsaved are gathered at our feet, they compass the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. This is when Jesus is stomping his foot foot on the head of the serpent All right. this goes back to Genesis 3 verse 15 and it's you know it's talked about all throughout the Bible all throughout the Bible it's the same thing God is going to put an end to 
this world into all iniquity on that day when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven God is going to destroy all evil forever all right so knowing that knowing that beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent then you have to conclude you have no other choice you have to conclude that this happens at the end of the world All right, if if God were to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent then he would have done it in vain if the serpent was not dead forever till I make thine enemies thy footstool that would all these verses that we read shall bruise the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly all right all these verses would be in vain and weak if this does not put an end to all wickedness forever all right it's not a vain verse it's a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled at the end of the world it you can't okay so you can't have two ends of the world you can't have two you can't say well this here is one time and then this is a, a second end of the world and then this is a third end of the world and then this is a fourth end of the world and then you can't say that I mean you can people are stupid I get it but it doesn't make it true alright so there's only one end of the world you can't have two ends of the world otherwise the first end of the world wasn't the end of the world alright so I I, got, I I know I said I was gonna talk about this I, I'm showing you verses I, I'm trying to be thorough thorough and I have to establish this fact here that the, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world and Satan is destroyed forever all right but when we go to Revelation 20 we see that Satan is bound for a thousand years and then at the end of the thousand years is the end of this world it's judgment day right it is appointed unto men once to die and after this comes the judgment All right. Hebrews 9 verse 27 and it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment and the judgment is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and the judgment is are you saved or are you not saved and of course if you're not saved you're destroyed forever and that's when fire comes down from God and devours all the unsaved it's when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent and remember when Jesus was on the cross and he he promised to the that other fellow he says verily I say unto thee today shalt thou be with me in paradise so that gentleman on the cross that day he would have died his next waking moment would have been or will be on the day Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven all right, so we got uh, numerous verses to point to here. Let's go do it this way. One, and let's just do this. A couple here. Not one. So in Daniel 12, verse 2, it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This happens at the end of the world when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, right? some many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting sh life and some to sh everlasting shame and contempt or some to um, whatever that says 
Now, First Thessalonians four. First Thessalonians four says, "For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God." That signifies the end of the world. Okay, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Alright? This happens at the end of the world. There shouldn't be any doubt whatsoever that this is the end of the world. Alright? So at the end of the world is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are gathered together. Alright? Jesus is asked specifically... What is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And at the end of the world is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and his angels gather us together, right? First the dead in Christ, then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is at the end of the world. And when we're up in the air with the Lord, and then the God of peace shall bruise Satan under our feet. All right, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. All right, this is when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all iniquity forever and ever. And then, of course, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Alright, so I'm, I'm hopefully I'm showing you all these parallels here with Matthew 24 when Jesus comes in clouds of heaven. This is the last trump, right? This is when uh, um, the angels with the great sound of a trumpet, right, signifying the end of the world. And then, of course, here in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, this signifies the end of the world. Right In 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. All right, this is signifying again. The end of the world and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet All right. there shouldn't be any confusion any doubt about it when it's the end of that when it's the end of the world it's the end of the world All right. and when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world all right so when it's the end of the world we are lifted up to meet the Lord in here those of us that are saved and the unsaved are gathered at our feet at the end of the world. Now there shouldn't be any mistake about that. All right, this is important to establish, okay? You might be wondering, what's this got to do with Satan being bound a thousand years? Well, we have to establish the facts. You can't ignore the facts just because you want your doctrine to fit a Hollywood movie that you watched last night on TV. All right. We have to establish the facts that are all throughout the Bible. All right. So now that we've established the fact that at the end of the world we are up in the air with the Lord and our enemy is gathered at our feet and our enemy is destroyed forever, then we have no choice but to conclude that Revelation 20 verse 9 is the end of this world. You can't have two ends of the world. Again, because if you have two ends of the world, the first end of the world was not the end of the world. Right? I, I understand that this is high IQ stuff, right? You gotta have an IQ higher that of a doorknob to understand this. I get it. It's tough. Really. It does make it tough 
seriously it makes it tough when so many people are teaching falsely that that's true it's so interesting to me that when Jesus is asked about the sign of his coming and of the end of the world the very first thing he says is take heed that no man deceive you for many shall come in my name saying I Jesus am Christ and shall deceive many so the deception in this world is is worse than it's ever been and it's much easier to lie to somebody than it is to convince them they've been lied to right, and so this is why I will continuously tell people just believe what the Bible says now here in Revelation 20 again we've established the absolute fact that verse 9 is the end of the world all right now working backwards when it, here in verse 8 when it says and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. This is Satan gathering the unsaved. Right? So in verse 9, we've already established that we are up in the air with the Lord. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. All right, and let's go to, real quickly, Revelation 3, verse 9. So this is not just a couple of, you know, or one verse that we're trying to fit into a Hollywood movie. This is all throughout the Bible. Revelation 3, verse 9, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Right? It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel all right so we're up in the air with the lord when oops pardon me we're up in the air with the lord when fire comes down from god when fire comes down from god we're not on the earth <laughs> right, we're not we're not going to suffer the wrath of god not you know if you're not saved you will there will be all the unsaved people gathered at our feet when this happens when it says here compass the camp of the saints about the beloved city that's talking about us being up in the air with the Lord and even here in the book of uh, Galatians chapter 4 but Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all so Jerusalem which is above right, Jerusalem which is above compass the camp of the saints about in the beloved city that city's above and we're up above with God when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all right so we're up above all the unsaved are gathered at our feet so this is what's going on here when Satan goes out to deceive the nations he gathers them together All right, just like what we read in Revelation 3 verse 9 behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee All right. now this clearly is maybe I better do this here this is clearly at the end of the thousand years Therefore, just from a logical standpoint, the end of the thousand years is the end of the this world. All right, so it says Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And why is Satan loosed out of his prison? The reason is given. To, he goes out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth. Okay. Now, this is... At the end of the world we've established that now let's solidify that what's this mean he's he's bound so let's go uh, let's go to Matthew 12 if I'm remembering correctly and Jesus oops there we go or else how can one or what one we what I'm sorry here all right so Jesus is having a conversation 
uh, with these fellas here. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he bind, I'm sorry, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. All right, so consider this. All right, let me read that again. How can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? So Jesus has defeated death, right? So Jesus has come, and the kingdom of God is with us right now. So Jesus has defeated death already. And now Jesus has made the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. Now why is this important? Well, because this was not so in the Old Testament. Alright, so this is a New Testament thing. And in order to understand the whole scripture, the whole Bible, it's important to understand that. It, you know, if you're going to be saved, it's important to know why you're saved. And, the, you know, obviously it's because of what Jesus has done for us. It's the only way that we can be saved is because of what he has done. All right, so... Let's do it this way here. Let's go to let's, let's go to the Old Testament. All right. So without giving a history lesson, let's just go to Exodus 19. And You know, it's tough to find a simple way to teach this, so let me try to sort of make it simple, but at the same time, uh, this gentleman, our friend, the harvester, or the harvest workers, he, he wants me to show scripture, but you didn't provide us with any scriptures. That's my mistake. I screwed up in the last video. Because I should have been thorough. I should always be thorough. Because you never know when somebody will come on for the first time. And, you know, maybe some of you watch every single day. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because I talk about the same thing every day. But then here comes a new fella. Has no idea what I'm talking about. So let me be clear and make this easy for anybody to see. In Exodus 19, um, how do I, uh, where do I start here? Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine saith the Lord. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. 
These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, just think about this for a second. So, there's one nation, right? Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A peculiar treasure unto me above all people. One nation, the nation of God, the nation of Israel, the nation or the children of Israel, the children of God, one nation. Now, outside of this one nation, this one group of children of Israel, outside of this one nation, outside of this one kingdom, there are many other nations and other kingdoms and other children which are not God's people which are below God's people All right. and then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people so this nation of God is exalted above all the other nations all the other nations are not of God okay that's this is Exodus 19 this is the Old Testament this is before baby Jesus was born and all of that <clears throat> that's important to understand all right so we'll go draw a parallel here in first Peter chapter two I think uh oh yep no this is it all right so let's just we better just cut right to it in first Peter chapter two verse nine but ye are chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light all right now let's draw the parallels here here in Exodus 19, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood and holy nation. A peculiar treasure unto me above all people. A peculiar people. Right? Now, which in time past were not a people. Alright, so in time past, we were not a people because the people of God were just inside this one nation but now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ which in time past were not a people but not are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy all right so now is the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ right so this is clear right, if you don't know that it that's my fault then for not making it clear All right starting in, in John chapter 11 verse 25 Jesus says unto her I am the resurrection All right real quickly hold that thought I am the resurrection blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection Jesus is the first resurrection he is the resurrection Jesus said unto her I am the resurrection and the life and he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die all right so now yeah i'm just don't lose sight of the don't poo poo this whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die so now the king of God is not just for the, these 
uh, the, these, this particular group of people. Right? The kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so consider this. Jesus says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matthew 21. Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you oops, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. All right, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof now again this goes back to what we read there in Exodus 19 you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation alright so the children of Israel were the nation of God and outside of that nation were the uh, nations deceived they were deceived by Satan. In other words, there's God's kingdom, and then there's Satan's kingdom. All right, there's God's nation, and then there are the nations of Satan. And again, Satan is the absence of God. All right, now, um, Jesus comes along and he says, "Look." No longer is the kingdom of God going to be just inside of these walls, if you will. No longer is the kingdom of God just for you only. But now the kingdom of God is available to everybody all throughout the world. See, he has broken down the barrier. And now because the kingdom of God is available... To anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ now now is Satan no longer in control of any of the nations the kingdom of God is was one nation now the kingdom of God is available in all nations therefore the strong man is bound he doesn't have total control over the nations like he did in the past. Right? So in Exodus in Exodus 19 there was one country but now the kingdom of God is available to everybody. All right, so the kingdom of God was within one country, and now the kingdom of God is available throughout all the world. And therefore, Satan is bound from deceiving the nations. Revelation 20, what's it say? Let's go up here. That he should deceive the nations no more. This is not a reference to individuals at all. This is a reference to nations. And that's important because at no time am I implying that Satan is no longer doing anything. And that would be stupid. I'm not saying that at all. I don't even know how to address that. It's so stupid. To, you know, that's not what I'm saying at all. Satan is not um, destroyed. Satan is still deceiving individuals. I mean, that's that's clear, right? Nobody. I'm not disputing that. Nobody disputes that. All right. Hopefully, what you're seeing, what I'm trying to say here, I'm trying to, you know, get this uh, to you, is that there is the 
kingdom of God and the nation of God and the nations outside of the nation of God were controlled totally 100% by Satan because Satan is the absence of God perhaps um, maybe there's a lot of confusion because of the idea that Satan is a God when Satan is no God at all Satan is just the spirit that is absent of God that's it so when you've got one nation the nation of God outside of that nation there is no God therefore there's the absence of God therefore the, the nations were deceived by Satan now here comes Jesus and so he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him now the nations there are no nations that are completely controlled by Satan because there is no nation that is completely absent of God all right the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ there's it there shouldn't really be any buddy claiming that this is talking about individuals there shouldn't be anybody claiming that at all all right I and mean, this is very it, to me it's 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 probably my fault that it, this seems so clear to me and I'm not doing a good enough job of teaching this but uh, <clears throat> you know this this uh, this idea that Jesus comes and he were transformed into our glorified body and there's a thousand years of yeah you know, what people walking around with no head and unsafe people and really that's the problem I have is when you're teaching that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's not the end of the world because everything that you're implying here harvest workers harvest workers 1218 you're implying that unsaved people can wait until after Jesus comes to believe in him and I think that's cruel that's as cruel as it gets because they can't wait if they're gonna have any chance at all if they have their only opportunity is today right now when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end there are no more opportunities to be saved and we all know it we all know it we're we were we were uh, we were made we were created this way to know this instinctively when it happens there's not going to be any mistake about it when it when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we're all going to instinctively know it's the end of the world whether we're saved or not saved it's it's built into us just like a cat if you have a litter box and you set a baby kitten who has never known another cat who has never seen a litter box you put a litter box next to a bait a kitten that kitten is gonna know to go poop in that litter box it's instinctive it's incredible we, there, there's better examples than that but that's just one example that's pretty amazing to me perhaps there are more amazing examples 
that you could give. I don't doubt that at all, but uh, my point is that we are instinctively made. We are built to know that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we're all going to know, saved and unsaved. All right, in Luke 21, it says, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. All right, now this is talking about when the sun and the moon and the stars um, and the, the distress of nations with perplexity, the sea, this is the end of the world. And everybody's going to know it. So much so that men are going to be having heart attacks because they know this is it. They know this is it. And it's it's going to be overwhelming for them at that moment. <clears throat> now they won't be able to escape the judgment of God, but we're, we see here that all the tribes of the earth will mourn. There's going to be absolutely no doubt when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. All right. So, at the end of the world, we are lifted up. We that are born of God. We that are born of the Spirit of God are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. First the dead in Christ, then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, the Bible is very clear that um, Jesus will stomp his foot on the head of the serpent. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. It's the end of the world. And then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. All right, when this happens at the end of the world, then all the earth will be have been cleansed from all unrighteousness. Then shall we be set back down on a new earth with a new heaven. All right. And when this happens, there is no more, <clears throat> there is no more iniquity. There's no more death. There's no more sorrow. No more pain. No more crying. All those things are going to be done away with. All right. The new Jerusalem which we read in in uh, Galatians I apologize I, I must have yeah um, Jerusalem which is above All right, that's the holy city the city of God which is above All right, and we're going to be lifted up in the clouds and we're going to be lifted up in the clouds on the last day. And that's, this is, that's where our city is. Okay, it's not on earth. Our city that we long for, that we hope for, is in the air. All right, and then so when everything is destroyed at our feet, then are we set back down on a new earth with new heavens. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. All right, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto him, me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Alright, so, it's clear. It's crystal clear that when Jesus comes, he's going to make all things new. He's going to destroy all iniquity forever. 
it's going to be over with. Just like what we read here in 1 Corinthians 15. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. It's the end of the world. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. So this idea that there's going to be... what This is the part that really gets me, man. If you believe that there's coming a thousand year reign of Christ, and then just admit you believe that there are going to be zombies walking around for a thousand years. Just go ahead and say it. Just be honest. No, that's not the case at all. All right? The Bible is not a sci-fi book, and Jesus is not ignorant of the end of the world. Jesus is not ignorant of this stuff. Right? And Jesus, in fact, is, is the first resurrection. And we are partakers of his resurrection. The second death has no power over us right now that are born of God. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. You're saved, sealed, secured, sanctified forever. Nothing can ever take that away. The second death has no power over you at all right now. Right? For whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Right? He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live right and so the second death has no power over us right now all right blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection jesus is the first resurrection the second death has no power over us right now first corinthians 15 all right for as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, even but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, he's the first resurrection. Afterward, they that are Christ, that is coming. That's our resurrection. We're not resurrecting on our own, but he is res resurrecting us. All we're doing is we're following him. He's led the way for us. He has died, defeated death, and resurrected and ascended to heaven we're just going to follow him when he returns all right so anyways um you know i i hope man i hope that's enough verses to just to at least give you something to think about you know what i'm saying okay so all these verses here they're great man they're fantastic the problem is i'm not making any sort of argument that Satan today is not present. All right. I don't know how to say it that way, but <clears throat> Satan is the absence of God. And there is a great absence of God in the world today. Revelation 20 is not talking about Satan, the, you know, what, no more lies, no more, no more death. During this thousand years, that's not what that's not what it's saying at all. Revelation 20 is clearly a reference to nations, right? So Satan is no longer able to deceive the nations like he did before Jesus came along, and then once we're lifted up out of this world. All that is remaining on the earth are unsaved people, which is clearly absent of the Spirit of God. Therefore, Satan is able to deceive the nations, but then God is allowing all this because the purpose of it is for Satan to gather together all the unsaved at our feet. Right, and this is a fulfillment of the prophecy that goes back to Genesis 3. It... it I, I don't know what more to say, honestly. I, w I just wonder. I, it's hard for me to sort of flip the mirror around, if you will, or look into the mirror, perhaps, and to see things from your perspective. I wish I could. It's very hard. But <clears throat> I, want to, I want to be able to teach this to people. And I'm just, I'm learning, okay? I'm learning, trying to figure it out, and uh, and you know, 
hopefully I, I've at least given you something to think about. And I do greatly appreciate this comment. I appreciate when somebody's bold enough to say, oh, I think you're wrong. Right or wrong, uh, you know, share your thoughts. Present, even if you don't believe it, present a view that you might think would be challenging. And by doing this, it helps both you and me. Uh, it helps me, and hopefully it'll help you as well. So anyways, that's it. Have a great day. Thanks, Harvester1218. Appreciate the comments. Take care.